Welcome back to Yousaf Reacts, and I am Lois. Today, we're diving into a timeless classic the 1980 romantic fantasy film, Somewhere in Time. Get ready to be transported back in time for a journey of love, mystery, and nostalgia. Let's get started. Somewhere in Time is a beautiful film that combines romance and fantasy in a unique and captivating way. Directed by Jeanette Schwark and based on the novel Bid Time Return by Richard Matheson, this movie has left an indelible mark on its viewers. The story revolves around Richard Collier, a playwright played by Christopher Reeve, who becomes obsessed with a photograph of a beautiful actress, Elise McKenna, portrayed by Jane Seymour. Richard discovers that Elise lived in the early 20th century and, through a form of self-hypnosis, he transports himself back in time to meet her. Their love story unfolds against the stunning backdrop of the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. The movie explores themes of eternal love, the passage of time, and the power of the human mind. The pocket watch, a significant prop in the film, symbolizes the connection between the past and the present. Somewhere in Time invites us to believe in the extraordinary, to hold on to love despite the constraints of time. The production of Somewhere in Time is as enchanting as its storyline. The Grand Hotel, with its historic charm, provided the perfect setting. And we can't talk about this film without mentioning its hauntingly beautiful score by John Barry. The music adds an ethereal quality that perfectly complements the narrative. Christopher Reeve and Jane Seymour deliver unforgettable performances. Reeve, known for his role as Superman, shows a different side of his talent as the lovesick playwright. Jane Seymour's portrayal of Elise McKenna is both enchanting and poignant, making their on-screen chemistry truly magical. Despite initial mixed reviews, Somewhere in Time has garnered a cult following over the years. Fans gather annually at the Grand Hotel for the Somewhere in Time weekend to celebrate the film. Its legacy continues to inspire and captivate new audiences. A Chicago playwright uses self-hypnosis to travel back in time and meet the actress whose vintage portrait hangs in a grand hotel. The movie opens with college student Richard Collier gathering rave reviews for his debut play. At the party, he comes face to face with an old woman, who presses something in his hand and whispers come back to me. He opens his hand to find an old pocket watch. Eight years later, Collier is a successful playwright in the middle of a breakup and writer's block. He leaves Chicago for a while to think things out, and finds himself near his alma mater at the Grand Hotel. While wandering around the hotel, he finds a photograph of a beautiful young woman. Richard is entranced, and attempts to find out whatever he can about her. During the course of his research, he learns she was Elise McKenna, a famous actress from the turn of the century. He also discovers she was the mysterious old woman who gave him the pocket watch. Finally determining that he must meet her somehow, he employs self-hypnosis and wills himself back to 1912. He meets Elise and they fall in love, which does not make her manager, William Fawcett Robinson, rather happy. Will their love survive Robinson's disapproval? Will Richard be able to remain in 1912? In 1972, college theater student Richard Collier Christopher Reeve celebrates the success of his first play. During the celebration, he is approached by an elderly woman, who places an antique pocket watch into his hand and pleads come back to me. Richard does not recognize the woman, who returns to her own residence afterward. Eight years later, Richard is a successful playwright living in Chicago, but has recently broken up with his girlfriend and is struggling with writer's block. Feeling stressed from writing his play, he decides to take a break and travels out of town to the Grand Hotel. While looking at a display in the hotel's museum, Richard becomes entranced by a strangely captivating photograph of a mysterious, beautiful young woman. With the help of Arthur B. Bilderwin, an old man who has been at the hotel since 1910, 
Richard discovers that she is Elise McKenna Jane Seymour, a famous early 20th century stage actress. Upon digging deeper, he learns that she was the aged woman who gave him the pocket watch eight years earlier, but died afterward, later that same evening. Richard visits Laura Roberts' Teresa Wright, Elise's former housekeeper and companion. While there, he discovers a music box that plays the 18th variation on Rhapsody. On a theme of Paganini by Rachmaninoff, his favorite musical piece. Among Elise's personal effects is a book on time travel written by an old college professor, Dr. Gerard Finney George Boscovic. Richard becomes obsessed with traveling back to 1912 and meeting Elise, who he has fallen in love. He seeks out Professor Finney, who believes that he briefly traveled through time through the power of self-hypnosis. To accomplish this process, one must remove all things from sight that are related to the current time. Finney warns Richard that such a process would leave one very weak physically, possibly dangerously so. Back in his hotel room, Richard dresses himself in an early 20th century suit and attempts to will himself into 1912 using tape-recorded suggestions. The attempt fails because he lacks real conviction, but after finding an old guest book from 1912 containing his signature, Richard realizes that he will eventually succeed. Richard again hypnotizes himself without the benefit of a modern tape recorder and allows his absolute faith in his eventual success to become the tipping point or trigger for the journey back through time. He slowly falls asleep and awakens to the sound of whinnying horses. In the year 1912, Richard looks all over the hotel for Elise, even meeting Arthur Beale as a little boy, but has no luck finding Elise. Finally, he stumbles upon Elise walking by a tree near the lake. She seems to swoon slightly when seeing him, but then suddenly asks, upon meeting him, is it you? McKenna's overbearing manager, William Fawcett Robinson Christopher Plummer, abruptly intervenes and sends Richard away. Richard stubbornly continues to pursue Elise until she agrees to accompany him on a stroll through the surrounding idyllic landscape. Richard ultimately asks why Elise wondered aloud, is it you? And she replies that Robinson somehow knows that she will meet a man who will change her life forever, and that she should be afraid. Richard then shows Lise the same pocket watch, which she will eventually give him 60 years in the future. Upon returning to the hotel, Elisa invites Richard to her play. He attends the comical farce, and she, in an almost trance-like state, recites an impromptu monologue dedicated to him. During intermission, he finds her posing formally for a photograph. Upon spotting Richard, Elise breaks into a radiant smile and veritably glows with soft affection. Just then, the camera's flash goes off and forever captures that wondrous moment in time. We now know that this picture is the same one that Richard will see 68 years later on a wall near the lobby at the Grand Hotel. He later receives a letter from Robinson asking to meet him immediately and saying that it is a matter of life and death. Robinson wants Richard to leave Elise, saying it is for her own good. Richard thinks Robinson is in love with Elise, but Robinson states that he is obsessed with her being a star and has no romantic interest in her. When Richard professes his love for her, Robinson has him bound and locked inside the stables. Robinson then informs Elise that Richard has left her and isn't the one, though she doesn't believe him and professes her love for Richard. Richard wakes up the next morning and escapes his constraints. He discovers that the acting troupe has already left for Denver, though Elise has returned to the hotel to find him. Richard then goes out to the hotel's capricious deck and begins giving in to despair, but presently perceives Elise calling his name and running towards him. They return to his room together, and it is there that Elise becomes truly intimate with a man for the very first time in her life. Later that evening, she asks Richard to marry him, and he readily accepts. She then informs him that the first thing she will do for him is to buy him a new suit, the suit Richard has been 
Wearing the entire time in 1912 is about 10 to 15 years out of style. Richard begins to show his true love how wonderful the suit is on account of its many pockets. He is alarmed when he reaches into one and finds a shiny, modern Lincoln penny with the mint date of 1979. This modern item breaks his hypnotic suggestion, and Richard feels himself rushing backwards from 1912 as though through a tunnel. And Elise screams his name in horror as he is pulled inexorably back to the present. Richard wakes up in the same room he just left, although now it is 68 years later. He is very weak and physically and emotionally exhausted from his trip through time and from the devastating, unexpected return. He scrambles desperately back to his own suite and attempts to hypnotize himself again, without success. After wandering around the hotel property and sitting interminably at the places where he spent time with Elise, Richard eventually retires to his room and remains there unmoving for days, until discovered by Arthur and the hotel manager. They send for a doctor and paramedics. Richard suddenly smiles and sees himself drifting above his body, and is drawn to a light shining through the nearby window, where he is reunited forever with Elise. Although Somewhere in Time is a film with a time travel theme, it has unlike, say, the time machine no overt science fiction elements. It has, in fact, more in common with the supernatural romance films such as A Portrait of Jenny, or Pandora and the Flying Dutchman which were popular in the 40s and 50s. Another time travel romance with which it has something in common is The British Quest for Love from 1973. Although that film does have some science fiction content, and its hero travels not back into the past, but rather to an alternate present in which among other differences the Second World War never took place. The opening scenes take place 1972. Richard Collier, a young playwright, is approached by an elderly woman, who places a pocket watch in his hand, and pleads with him to come back to her. Eight years later, Richard, suffering from writer's block, decides to take a break at an elegant turn of the century. Hotel actually the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, Michigan. During his stay, he becomes captivated with a photograph of a beautiful young woman, whom he discovers is Elise McKenna, a famous early 20th century stage actress. He also learns that she was the woman who gave him the pocket watch eight years earlier, but that she subsequently died later that same evening. Richard becomes obsessed with the idea of traveling back into the past to meet Elise as a young woman, and learns about auto-suggestive time travel from his old college professor. Through self-hypnosis, he travels back in time to the year 1912, where he does indeed meet Elise, who is staying at the hotel. The two fall in love, but they face an obstacle in the shape of her obsessively protective manager, William Fawcett Robinson, who fears that the budding romance will damage Elise's career. As with a number of time travel films, the plot, especially its dramatic conclusion, will not always bear the rigid application of strict logic. One might come to the conclusion that Richard's trip into the past was merely a self-induced hallucination, were it not for the fact that concrete evidence survives to show that he actually did visit the hotel in 1912. His signature, for example, appears in an old hotel register for that year, and he himself was responsible for taking the photograph which came to obsess him 68 years later. This is the film which proved that Christopher Reeve was more than just a muscle-bound superhero, and that Jane Seymour was more than just a Bond girl. There are also good contributions from Bill Irwin as Arthur, the elderly, long-serving hotel employee who remembers meeting Elise when he was a boy, and from Christopher Plummer as Robinson. Plummer does not play Robinson, as he could have done, as a straightforward villain. It is clear that he believes in Elise and will do anything to further her career. The relationship between Robinson and Elise is reminiscent of that between Lermontov and Victoria in Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes. There is a suggestion that, 
at least subconsciously, he may be in love with her. But on a conscious level, his love for Elise the woman has been sublimated into his concern for Elise the artiste. Director Jeanet Schwartz succeeds in evoking a romantic, dreamlike atmosphere, aided by the visual beauty of the Grand Hotel and its surroundings. By the radiant loveliness of Jane Seymour, and by the elegance of the Edwardian costumes. Another important factor in creating this atmosphere is the lush musical score, composed by John Barry, and the use of the 18th variation of Rachmaninoff's Rhapsody on a theme of Paganini. The use of this piece is deliberately anachronistic. Although Rachmaninoff was already an internationally known composer by 1912, the Rhapsody was not written until 1934. So it is hardly surprising that Elise is not familiar with it. This is a film with a loyal cult following. There is even an international network of somewhere in time enthusiasts. Cults, whether religious or cinematic, can often be incomprehensible to outsiders. And I therefore tend to be suspicious of anything described as a cult movie. A phrase which can be a euphemism for pretentious nonsense. Likely to prove totally baffling to those who have not been initiated into the mysteries of the cult. There are, however, numerous exceptions, in which case the phrase can be more accurately translated as excellent film unjustly neglected by the critics, and this is the category into which Somewhere in Time falls. Upon its first release in 1980, it was not particularly successful, either critically or at the box office. Its fanciful plot and its lush romanticism were perhaps out of tone with the materialistic early 80s. And this style of filmmaking must have seemed rather old-fashioned in the age of Star Wars. Yet since then, appreciation of the film has increased. Perhaps because we have once again learned to appreciate unashamed romanticism in the cinema. The date to which Richard travels back, 1912, is significant, as it comes towards the end of the last great romantic era in our history. Before the world was irrevocably changed by the mechanized destruction of the First World War, the late Victorian and Edwardian periods often known as the Progressive Era to Americans seemed to be an age of optimism, of progress, an age when everything seemed possible. This is a film which captures something of the spirit of those times. A film which celebrates the power of love and its ability to achieve the seemingly impossible. Seen in this light, the implausible nature of the plot need not trouble us. 8 tenths. Somewhere in time remains a timeless testament to the power of love and the human spirit. Whether you're a long-time fan or discovering it for the first time, this film is sure to leave a lasting impression. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below about your favorite moment from somewhere in time. Until next time, keep dreaming and believing in the magic of the movies.